Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you haven't met me yet, I'm Dana Carey, and I'm part of the admin team for the Facebook group. I teach eighth grade. Uh, I have Math 8 and Algebra 1. And I started building thinking classrooms in fall and did it the best all year. I won't say I'm perfect at it by any means, um, but I like to talk about it and get ideas from other people. So um, that's what we're here doing. So today is chapter three, which is where students work in the thinking classroom. Uh, so we're talking about the vertical non-permanent surfaces or the NPS as you often see abbreviated in the group. Um, and I have it recording. I'll get those posted um, later this afternoon because um, I'm at school and it's freezing and uh, super cold. I've had to go outside between sessions to warm up. <laughs> so um, anyway, so I'll go home and get those loaded up. Um, all right, so to start, does anyone have any questions or Anything from the chapter that stood up to you, um, feel free to just jump on in. I'll just say I haven't started this yet. I found the book a few months ago. I've been reading it over the spring, trying to think about which of my grade 9 through 12 classes, if any, I can do this with. I hope it's at least one. That's my intent, but whether it's all four, I don't know. And an issue that's going to, that I have to face this year is that I teach in a different classroom almost every period. So I might, I won't even have the ninth graders in the same room. Uh, I could have them in four different rooms over the course of the week, let alone my 10ths and 11s and so on. And all the rooms are different. Some of them are science labs with almost no wall space at all. Uh, one of them has a huge wall full of whiteboards, so I don't know what I'll have next year. That definitely makes it a challenge. I had someone in the previous session who uh, has that same issue. She teaches middle school. I think I think it was sixth grade. Um, so yeah, it's definitely going to have to be figuring out what routine and what works for you. Um, Definitely a challenge there. Uh, why? I'm curious as to why you have to move rooms. Is it is because like the the other person, um, because of COVID, they left students where they were and the teachers moved, and they're still doing that. Is that well, for you? That's what we did two years ago, but that would have been easy because then the ninth grade would have been in the same place all year. No, it's a scheduling issue. We have a small building, not enough rooms uh, for. Yeah, you know, I mean. For, for the classes and they could probably do a slightly better job of it, but it hasn't been their priority to make sure we're always in a particular room. Gotcha. Hey, that could be a thinking task for your students. Hey, schedule <laughs> our rooms. <laughs> yeah, they would fix it, right? I'm also thinking maybe, you know, just to make it easier on yourself, maybe just pilot it with one class, the one that has the most vertical non-permanent surfaces and, you know, just, so that you get your bearings and then, you know. I mean, I think I need to decide which class I want to do it with based on the content and age and maturity and just do it wherever it is. I've bought a set of white books. Mm -hmm. uh, my department's bought a two-sided vertical easel that I could at least move on the same floor. It would be harder if I'm teaching on the first floor and then the fourth three minutes later. But um, I mean, I'm not so worried about that. I am concerned because every classroom has its own set of furniture. I'm already like the last three years, I would walk into every classroom and in the three minutes that I had, unless I was first period or after lunch, rearrange all the tables into groups because it seems like 90% of my teachers like to teach in desks in rows and I'm in the decided minority there. So th it's going to be the same that I'm rearranging, but Am I rearranging all of the furniture so that it's in one huge heap in the middle and nobody can get at it <laughs> or something else that I don't know yet. It sounds like you definitely have some challenges ahead, but um, 
but like Ann was saying, I would, I would try to just focus on that one or two classes where you know you can at least get them to the vertical surface in the random groups. And because um, I mean, that's one of the things from the chapter that stood out to me that Peter says that of all the techniques they discovered, that the, verti the vertical surfaces and the random groups had the most profound effect. And I've heard a lot of heard in, as in I've seen on the Facebook feed, a lot of teachers say, well, I only did the groups and, and the vertical surfaces. That's all I've done. And that's okay. You know, you just do those pieces that work for you within your constraints. And, and I have to tell myself quite often, don't feel bad that you can't do all of it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm okay doing those two. The thing that's worrying me more is how do I arrange the thinking tasks uh, how do I take the material I've been teaching, which I've been teaching as have probably most teachers as a, here's how to do it, now you go do it, and turn it into something else. Um, the one thing that, that Peter says about the tasks is that delivering them is to deliver them verbally. Um, so there's that option. Um, I personally, do not do well with that. And I, it's probably just me and I need to try to do better about that. Um, I did some where I projected them to the whiteboard um, and that worked okay. And I did a lot where, especially if we were doing some uh, several problems and just kind of practicing problem, um, I would put them on a paper and magnetic you know to use a magnet and put them on the each station and so each yeah i think had their set of problems right i'm thinking more along the lines of how do i break it down i mean and i know that it's it's both in the book and i know that i that what i haven't looked at yet on the facebook group is all of the resources and thin slicing and so on mm -hmm. so i'm still very much figuring it out and I, I I'm aware there are resources that I can draw on I'm here yeah. to listen mostly but. yeah it it can be a little overwhelming it's a lot it's a lot for sure um but yeah the the group has done a really good job at putting together the resources and and uh yeah I I use them quite often myself so yeah that's that's interesting what you say about the verbal right so I, you know, I haven't tried this either. So I was wondering about that with, you know, Peter saying that how it actually worked. So thank you for telling us your experience. Do you feel like it was just you were too reticent to try it, or or you tried it and it just didn't ever work? I I think it's probably my fault. Um, and I think we negative words in this. <laughs> well, you know, eighth graders don't listen very well. Oh, I know. <laughs> freshman and, and I I I probably just didn't train them well enough that no this is how we're doing it you need to listen mm. um but and I did sometimes give problems verbally if we were doing problems and I did sometimes say your next problems on this board oh you're on this one okay your next problems on board eight Oh, okay. Well, you you need to get it from this board. It's your next one. But mm. part of the problem with that too is um, students don't always write well enough to read it. Mm. So sometimes getting it off another board, it's yeah they had trouble reading what they wrote. Mm. Um, so that was a little bit of an issue. Um, but I I don't know. I don't know why I didn't do real well with that piece. Um, and then we just kind of got into this, um, putting it on paper and putting it at the stations. And I, I think I liked the way that worked because they work at such different paces that I have some groups who could get through a lot more problems and some groups who maybe just did two or three that day, yeah. and, you know, and so it kind of worked for that. And I didn't have to for me, it freed me up to focus more on the groups who actually needed help instead of worrying about, oh, here's your next problem. Oh, here's your next problem. And, and facilitating the next problem 
as opposed to using that time to actually help the groups progress mm. through and, and understand what they're doing and have those conversations. But mm. hmm. I think you have to do what works for you. And you said there's some videos on his website. I haven't looked yet. Um, that there right? are videos in the Facebook group. Um, if you go to the guides, uh, there is a spreadsheet that's just for um, videos, podcasts, those kinds of things. Mm. And, um, there are some videos that we have uh, with Peter and Will Dunn um, did a lot of really good videos. Uh, I think it was last summer he did those. Um, very good. There are some podcasts that are book studies that are really good. Uh, mm. The of it all, I listen to every one of those and there are a couple of them I listened to twice. Mm. They're really good. Um, so um, a lot of good resources there in, in that spreadsheet. Right. I usually get, you know, inspired by watching videos like we used to do Marzano, right? With, with kids, right? Like how does this actually work in practice kind of thing? Um, yeah. Um, Joe Bowler, um, I don't know if you've heard of her. She does the mathematical mindset. A lot of her stuff aligns with Building Thinking Classroom. Hmm. She has, they do the week of inspirational math. Um, she has the, the Facebook page called YouCubed. Yeah. And uh, the website YouCubed and which has all of, of her videos. She has a video for each day for the week of inspirational math. And we use some of those videos. Um, they're really good. And they're short, like three to five minute videos. So yeah, one thing that was circling with me with the verbal thing was because I am going to be teaching virtually in the fall, um, kind of like a mission impossible thing, like or even like a telephone game sort of thing where I give one student in the group, right, or, or pull them all into a breakout room and say, OK, this is your problem. This is your mission. You know, any questions now you go and explain the problem to your group. And so then, you know, right. part of problem solving is understanding the problem to start with. So yeah so you're teaching yes. virtually all the way through to next fall because of covid or for other reasons no i'm i'm transferring to our our local virtual school in the fall uh -huh. so i was brick and mortar up through may 26 but yeah so and i've never done <clears throat> this though i had followed the group on facebook this last year I was trying to you know micro include things which didn't you know didn't really work to try to not do it from the very beginning, you know, and train the kids, as you say, right? But but I all of this stuff was circling, and I was like, oh, I can see how that would help if I hadn't, you know, done it the traditional way, as you said, like uh, I do, we do, you do, you know. Yeah. Yep. Anyone else have anything they want to say right now? Um, one of the other things in the chapter that stood out to me was uh, in the frequently asked questions on page 65, it talks about the movement of the marker and who gets the marker and why do they have the marker and getting that marker to go to other kids. And um, his, his answer in that is about um, having students not write their own thinking. And that worked pretty well for me. Um, and it helped in a lot of ways. In one way with, with my algebra kids who are the high ability kids, you know, those kids are, those kids believe that faster is better. And it, it's really hard to, to change that mindset. And so they just want to get up there and hurry and get it done and, and, they want to know if it's the right answer or not. And, and they really struggle with not telling them it's the right answer, but um, it, it was about they, hurry and get it done. And so it didn't matter who had the marker, whoever knew how to do it was going to write it because they wanted to get it done. They wanted to be the first to get it done and they wanted to have it done and have it right. And so when I made them switch to um, who, whoever has the marker is the scribe, and you have to write what someone else is thinking. And I also took it from the perspective of, 
you get to boss that person. If someone else has the marker, you get to tell them what to write. So you're the boss. And they liked that. They liked, you know, that perspective of it. But um, it helped them slow down and think about it more. Um, and it helped them to work together more. And the other thing I liked about it is then when I have those groups um, who are struggling and maybe someone knows and someone doesn't, well, if you don't know what to do, then you're the one who gets the marker and someone's going to tell you what to write. And so it worked well for those groups also, um, because sometimes you, you get a group where you've got three kids, but only one person knows what to do. Well, then that person tells someone else what to write. And so then you uh, how do they that. know? I'm how sorry. do they know when when they're right if you never tell them? <laughs> That's another thing I have to get better at. I'm not good at not telling them. And I've talked to my counterpart about that. We we've, we've had that discussion that um we we're gonna have to say things like, how can you test it to see if you're correct? Or how can you estimate to see if you're correct? Um, instead of, I mean, I think there's times, I, I mean, I get what he says where, you know, I'm not telling them, but I do think there's times where you need to tell them that they're correct and you need to tell them they're on the right track. Um, I think they need to have that confirmation that I'm just not totally off somewhere where I shouldn't be. Um, but I also think from, from my perspective, I need to do more of how can you test that to see if you're correct? How can you check it? What could you do to check your answer to see if you're right? Or at least to see if you're in the right area. Um, Cause that's a whole nother processing skill that they, they don't have um, that they need to, to build. And, and I can facilitate that better through those kinds of prompts. I definitely need a better poker face. <laughs> and see, that's something I do not have. I do not have a poker face. Like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that mean you, you would give them the next problem even if they're not correct? That's or what Peter says to do. Yeah, you'll you'll see that as you get through the book. I don't remember which chapter that's in, but um yeah. That that's that's his advice. Can you suggest that they check to see whether people at other boards have the same answer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Isn't part of the reason for not telling them the right, whether they're right or not, is that they can then use that same strategy on the next problem that they're given and see if it still works. Like there's that exploring as they yes. go. Okay. Yes. Yep. And it's also that it's not always about the answer. It, it is, it is about the process or the strategy you used or, you know, how you got there. Um, and so, you know, not focusing so much on, did I get it right? But did I, how was my process? So, but it's, it's, it was hard for me. It, it was really hard for me. Definitely a, a chapter that's, or section that's on my list to reread. I have a quick question about that. So, does that rule of not telling them the correct answer only apply to the non-curricular tasks or does that also apply to when we've gotten to the point where we are, I think they call it slicing or whatever. And doing slicing? The, yes, the actual curricular task when we're embedding that in. We still don't tell them that's when correct. they're doing that's, that's what That's what Peter advises, yes. that that you don't tell them if they have the correct answer or not. It, it's all problems. Okay. I know it's a struggle. It, that, that's a hard one for me. And, and I did not do very well at that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I understand uh, why, but I, I still struggled. I mean, if it were me, I'd wanna know if I had it right. Right. I would want that confirmation that, hey, my, my process worked, you know, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a struggle for me. That makes me think, have, have you heard of that activity, my favorite no, where 
the teacher has all the students write down, you know, their work on a card and she goes through and pulls out all the ones where, you know, they just got their thinking and, and just, and puts it up there anonymously. And then the class all teases it out, like where, where the error was, but she also makes sure to praise, you know, the thinking, right? And and yeah. And I the, think that comes in with, um, and you'll read that later on in the book, if you haven't gotten there about the consolidation and as you're as the kids are working you go around with your different colored marker mm -hmm. and mark on the board things you don't want them to erase that they they did well or maybe they didn't maybe you want to talk about a common mistake mm -hmm. um, and so then when you wrap up to bring together the concept you refer to the the boards that you marked the sections on and and have students talk to the class about what they did and how they did it. Another part I need to get better at. <laughs> yeah, since we started this book group, I was like, I'll just read it along with the group so I, so I can remember what I just read. <laughs> right, no, I get it because I'm rereading, I've been rereading it with, with the group. So um, yeah, that way it was fresh in, in my mind what I, because. I've, I've read different parts of the book several times um, that I hadn't read this part in a while, so. Yeah, I just got the actual book this summer and was just lurking on the group trying to get ideas. <laughs> so I was so and there are a lot of ideas in the group. Yeah. 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 Such a challenging right year. <laughs> yes. So, um, with regard to the vertical surfaces, I mean, I know, um, David, you've got a challenge ahead of you. Um, does anyone else have, do you think it's gonna be a challenge to have your vertical surfaces? Um, do you have enough space? How are you gonna accommodate that? Have you thought about that or maybe you already do it and you've got it figured out or? Because I know in some classrooms, it's a challenge to get vertical spaces. You have to use the I, windows. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was saying, I think I'm going to have a, some problems with that too. Um, unless I request like some furniture taken out of the room, because we have like a lot of bookshelves and, and um, just like David, I share the rooms with others. Um, so there's more than one teacher desk, like things like that. So having enough space to have the vertical stuff on the walls is going to be difficult. Um, initially, I was thinking of using the, uh, you know, the papers, the big papers that I already have the sticky parts behind it. But then where I read it, it said, don't do that because it's not good. And I was like, great. So <laughs> now I don't know. Right, because it because you could go in and just stick them up and be ready, right? Right. But right. Did I read somewhere that Post-it makes an an erase a dry erase Post-it? I think yeah. that yeah, it was it mentioned in the book. Yeah. Book chapter was was that a hold on. yeah that was one of them on page sixty three. Yeah. Yeah. The um dry erase surface yeah. by post it yeah yeah i don't mean i don't i don't know how much that would cost but yeah that would be an option or um i know you can get um poster board that's dry erase if you could okay. find a way to i don't know if that was that blue tacky stuff if you could you know put it up with that and then take it down i don't know i or bought a i bought a whiteboard wipe book which is like six or 10 pages I haven't looked yet. And then uh, somebody on your group mentioned a few different kinds of tape. I just bought a roll of each and I'll see what works for okay. sticking those up. I'm gonna need more markers though. Another option might be to use um, like the command strip Velcro. So like the one piece would stay on the wall and then you just come in and Velcro up your pages each day in the same locations. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Don't know if that would work for me because I just can't count on anything being there from one day to the next. Yeah. 
What I just found was a nice big two foot by three foot um, artists um, portfolio for carrying the white book or even just storing it because otherwise I'm going to come back and find that some other teacher has taken them all. Yeah. So yeah, like a standard whiteboard in the classroom. How many groups are expected to be on it? Like maybe two groups, or is it just like I'm thinking I'll have maybe about 33 students in the classroom. Being able to have enough space for 10 groups is going to be a challenge. So, yeah. okay. Yeah, that that will definitely be a challenge. And then you have to contend with all the desks. Right. Yeah. Is, is it possible for you to do some tabletop easel style things so the kids can still be standing, but they'd be standing around a desk or a small group of desks? And that way you don't have all your, your groups in the perimeter of your room, but you could have some more centrally located. Sure. I'll have to look into that. The thing is that, yeah. The becoming expensive i don't know if the school will be willing to help with that yeah. yeah yeah i mean right now we write on the desks but mm -hmm. i guess it's not because it's horizontal it's not a good thing but they write on the desks all the time right uh, but switching that to the um all vertical is going to be interesting well and one wonders if if you have some groups that are working horizontally, those groups change every day. So if a kid works horizontal one day a week, is that mm. detrimental to their overall learning in the grand scheme of things? And I think the idea is we do as much as we can, we can. knowing what the gold star standard is. And, and then we have to still work within the environment in which we're That's at. A good idea. Or, or you might even be able to rotate them during class. Yeah. You know. Um, or, you know, like if you have two groups that are horizontal and you, your class as a whole is like finished a task and they're ready to go on to the next one, you could like switch out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that would work. Yeah. And how long do the non curricular tasks last? <laughs> I know it's supposed to start in the first five minutes, but is there a suggested, I don't know if further in the book, is there a suggested time limit on how long it should take? Not that I saw, um, and it's gonna depend on the task. Some tasks obviously will take longer than others. Um, what we decided to do this year for our non-curricular tasks is only allow about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. And we, the one reason we did that is because we wanna do some other things like show a video, um, talk about group norms and and work on mindset and so we're limiting our time because they don't need the whole period for a non time. right yeah and um, I mean I think really about 25 minutes is plenty of time um, because by then especially since it's new to them they kind of start to feel the burn you know and they're just like yeah you know it, it kind of got to build that that stamina of being at the boards and this is what we're doing. And um, so I, I think 25 minutes would be plenty. Um, and, and they don't have to solve it. You know, I'd, I'd have kids who, but what's the answer? We're not done. I said, I'm not telling you the answer. Okay. <laughs> you know, and I, I would give the excuse, I have other classes today or working the same problem. I'm not telling you the answer. Okay. Um, so, and, and they were okay with it that way. Um, but, you know, still it's working them into, what do you mean you're not telling me the answer? I'm not telling you. Um, so, but yeah. Um, I would say anywhere from 15 to 25 minutes is plenty. Thank you. We all have other things to do during class. Yeah. So, and, and, and it may be the same with the curricular ones. Some days we would spend almost the whole period at the boards and some days we may go up and, and just do about 15 minutes at the board because maybe we have uh, an assessment or 
you know, just some other piece to that content that we weren't going to be at the boards for. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I, that he I'm, doesn't. I'm sorry. One thing he doesn't really mention in the books is in the book is project. I, I'm assuming I'm assuming that you can still do projects on a horizontal surface. I mean, depending on or on a computer, depending on what the project is. We did. Um, I know there are some who just strictly stuck with putting kids to the boards, and that's okay. Um, for me, for on my counterpart, we wanted to switch things up every now and then, um, and so we would every couple of weeks or so, try to throw in a different kind of activity. Um, maybe it still involved group work, but uh, just something that was different and maybe not necessarily at the boards. Um, because sometimes you just need different. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to change things up. And, uh, and that's okay. I mean, Peter says, this is a framework. Yeah. And you do what works for you. And, and he says, also in that same section, don't, don't go away from all your teacherly craft that makes you the good teacher you are. And, you know, bring all that with you into the building thinking classrooms and blend that all together. And so, you know, I, I think we still have to do some of those awesome activities that we do. And that's just my opinion, but you have, you just do what works for you, I think. We have a few minutes left. Um, this is about a 35, 40 minute session because I have the free Zoom. And uh, so it's a, we only allow 40 minutes. Um, does anyone have anything else they wanna add or ask or talk about? It's pretty short. I had a question about moving the marker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you do have those high flyers who are used to just finding the answer, telling everyone else the answer and let's move on, who, you know, I mean, there's so many groups. So I'm thinking about specific students from last year. Some of them just kind of commandeer the marker, right? Because I did try the one marker group with, with a group of seniors that I had. And, and I found that some of them just commandeer the marker and, you know, the other kids are not the kind that will speak up and say, hey, they, they don't move the marker. They didn't pass the marker. They just let them, right? So did you have any strategies for that that you came across? Um, I, I had a student who always wanted the marker. And um, I would go to that group and say, um, this student doesn't get to write today. <laughs> and that may sound kind of extreme, but you know what I'm talking about. Because mm -hmm. kids, I mean, and they can't help it. And they just, they're, this kid's brain went 90 miles an hour and he wanted to just get up there and, and write it and get it done and be done and yay, I'm done and we're done. And, and so there were times where I'd say, that's my alarm, um, that this student doesn't get to write today. Yeah. Student will tell you what to write. You know, they can contribute that way, but they don't get to do the writing. And right. that's where it helps to use that scribe technique. Mm -hmm. But you, you do have to watch those kids closely because they will they will still try to take over. Right. And I also wasn't using the visibly random groups. So, you know, they were they were seniors. They were used to letting him do it, right? Yep. And so they were just like, yeah, he's got the answer. Yes. So that's what I mean. I just pick tried to pick out little things to try to use and that. That was one of the things that I was like, oh, well, that didn't work. So, but I could see how the, the visibly random groups changing all the time, then they wouldn't be able to lean on that one person or, yeah. or that one person. And, and, and they'll get, they'll get into a group where they have someone who, who equals their um, strength and, and fight for the marker and, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So is the scribe the scribe for the whole activity while they're standing there? Or I know the scribe, the others will speak and they will write it down, but they hold the marker the whole time or at some point they switch to somebody else's writing and they're listening to the other people. Ideally they would switch. 
and everyone would get a turn. What I did, like if we were doing thin slicing, so we were doing a series of problems, then I would say new problem, new marker. You know, okay. so else, you switch the marker when you switch problems. Um, I've heard where some teachers, you know, okay, you did that step, so now it's time to pass the marker okay. and pass it that way. So I think it kind of just depends on your content and, you know, just how you want to lay that out. But I ended up, okay, it's, no, it's a new problem. It's time to pass the marker. But then I also got into where the kids would say, oh, well, but I did this problem and they're going to do that problem. No, okay. no. We all work them together. And that's where I had to go more to you don't write your own thinking because then it was their problem. So I'm standing here goofing off, talking to somebody else, doing whatever I want while they're doing their problem because I already did my problem. Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah, that became an issue. All right. Well, we're about out of time. So um, I appreciate you all coming. I hope you got something from our session today. And um, there'll be more sessions coming. The admin team is working on getting those together and um, on certain concepts. And so just be on the lookout for those to get posted in the events. Great. Thank you, Thank you Thank so you. much. You're welcome. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. You too.